Hello, I'm Adam Crowley and welcome to our course EH 299 Zombies. In this opening lecture we will be considering a number of topics. We'll be starting off with a brief introduction, then moving into this question what is a zombie? We'll be trying to understand how it is we might best approach zombies as a concept, think about what the zombie has meant historically and perhaps over a number of decades, and maybe even a little bit in this opening lecture about what the zombie means or can mean in contemporary American culture. So that's the direction that we're going to be moving over the course of this video. You'll want to make it your practice to take good notes while you watch the videos. Don't watch them passively. When something comes up that gets your attention, a point you might find yourself either in agreement or disagreement with, or a point that you think might lead you to further investigations, make sure to pause the video, take the notes, and have that as a record for yourself, as that will help you a great deal when you get into the writing um, projects, the writing assignments for this course. So I would kind of begin with that observation. Okay, so what I want to do just in this initial video is some fundamental things, and I want to raise this question first of what is a zombie. A zombie could be, well, a number of things depending upon when you were born over the last century. And let's talk a little bit about what I mean by that. If you are someone who has only recently become aware of zombies, okay, um, you are perhaps, you know, a fan of The Walking Dead or iZombie or something even newer than that, the returned um, the American version uh, of a really interesting French series, you might have a certain conception of the zombies that would differ probably dramatically or very dramatically from the zombie as it was first conceptualized, at least in the American kind of popular imagination in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And we'll talk about that conception in some detail today. If you were somebody who first became aware of zombies in the 1960s with George Romero's uh, really famous film, uh, Night of the Living Dead, in which, by the way, there are no actual zombies. There are only creatures that are referred to as ghouls, but that's a point for another day. You might have a very different distinction of what a zombie should be, uh, a slow, shambling you know, individual who's been transformed into a cannibal um, through death and the intervention of some kind of radiation from outer space, uh, perhaps from a satellite that's returned from a scientific expedition, which is quite different than the kind of zombie you will see in a film like 28 Days Later, which we'll watch later this term, in which zombies are very fast and are human beings who are infected with what's called a rage virus. So there's a range of different kinds of zombies. So when I throw up the question to you, what is a zombie? I, I, I do literally mean it. What is a zombie? Because while we might think that we know the history of zombie in film, in literature, and in other forms of popular culture, tells us that the zombie is conceptualized in very different ways in different decades. Um, and there are periods that we'll see where the zombie is quite quite popular. And we literally can't crawl through all the films we'll be watching fast enough because there are just so many films about zombies that come out in certain decades. And then we'll see there are other times in American culture, most notably, you know, the beginning to near the end of the 1990s, where the zombie essentially vanishes from popular culture in the sense that there are just many, there are just fewer examples of it to be found um, in popular media, films, novels, things like that. And the question is, why does that happen? Why is this transformation taking place? So it's, it's a big concept to address, and the question may or may not make any sense to you if you don't inherently value the zombie as something. If you see the zombie as just kind of this ephemeral entertainment, maybe something superficial, maybe something that is just used in scary stories to, 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 to make people upset, then this might be the wrong class for you. But if you're willing to at least entertain the notion that the zombie says something significant about who we are now, and it has said an awful lot about who we have been for the past century or so in terms of a, of a culture, really as a civilization, then you might begin to find some really fascinating concepts floating around in this course. Okay, So as we approach this concept of zombie, we need to make a number of choices to begin our journey together. When we think about zombies and all they can be and all that they've represented, we could arguably begin this class in any number of ways. The zombie has a rich history in film. The zombie has a rich history on the stage. The zombie has a rich history um, in, in novels and short stories. There are zombie video games. There's zombie themed 
punk rock bands, there are a number of ways into the concept, or to the question, excuse me, what is a zombie? Now for this course, I'm obviously an English professor, and my approach is going to be initially through literature. And that'll make more sense as we get a little bit further into the lecture. But I want to talk about the literary roots of the zombie because they can help us understand why and how the zombie bursts into the popular imagination the way it does um, in the mid-1920s and into the early 1930s. Now, while I'm going to be talking about a number of literary examples in this lecture, it is certainly true that the vast majority of documents I have you look at in this course will be films, okay? And there is a very important distinction between works of prose and, you know, what, what you would see inside of a movie theater um, or what you would stream as a film, you know, on a contemporary technology. So we will talk about that divide and how to, how to straddle that divide as we move into the course, but I think it's completely fair to start with some basic questions about literature and how it is that literature as a cultural concept, as a cultural investment, as a cultural concern, can, can, can help us understand or lay the foundation for asking the question, what is a zombie? It's another way to think about it, perhaps a bit more grotesque, but this is a class on zombies, so why not start with something grotesque? If you think about the zombie as uh, a house, okay, um, that you approach, uh, perhaps a haunted house, uh, with all the tropes of a haunted house, you might recognize that there are multiple ways into the house. You can take the front door, you can go in through the back door, you can go in through the basement, you might break a window, you might do you know, any number of things to get into this house. There are many ways into this house. There are many ways to approach the zombie, and we're going to go in through the door of, of literature, okay, the door of literature. We could, we could go in through the door of art, uh, in terms of painting or sculpture. We could go in directly through the door of film, but I think we're going to pick the door of literature for reasons that I think will become more apparent in a few moments, okay? So let's just step back in this class and present a first formal definition. Um, and for our first formal definition, we're going to be thinking about just very broadly the concept of literature. What literature is, what literature does, why it's so significant. Now, there are many different definitions for literature. And I here am in no way trying to argue that I am presenting you with the definitive definition for literature. But what I want to do is give you a definition for literature that will work in this course and it will help organize our thinking as we begin to pursue this question, what is a zombie? Okay, so for our purposes, when we think about literature, I want us to envision it as essentially this. Written communication that conveys a culture's aspirations and anxieties. I'll say that again. Written communication that conveys a culture's aspirations and anxieties. Aspirations, of course, are the things that we, we hope for, we strive toward, we aspire to do things. And we write about these things. We might write about them in stories of the families we hope to have or the challenges we hope to overcome or the places we hope to visit. Um, a great deal of science fiction is aspirational. Will we go to the stars? Will we go to the Mars? Will we go somewhere else? Can we get there? We also use literature sometimes at the exact same time, but also in different ways to express anxiety, stresses, concerns, fears. If we look back at some of the major works associated with the birth of the birth, excuse me, of the novel. So many examples behind myself. We think about what novels are, where novels come from. There's a number of arguments that will peg the origin of the art of the novel in vastly different time periods. Some arguments will find the beginning of the novel in the um, you know first or second century with an author like Apuleius in the Golden Ass, which is a story that you may or may not be familiar with. Others will say that Don Quixote by Cervantes, um, you know, well over a millennia later, uh, in a few centuries as well, um, gives us the first novel. You have other people who will say that Robinson Crusoe, uh, written by Daniel Defoe, which emerges around 1719, gives us really something like the first version of a novel that is would be recognized by a modern day reader as a novel. Uh, other people would, would throw the, the kick the can a little bit further down the road and say you might look at something like Samuel Richardson's Pamela, uh, 
which comes out in 1740, which is a large novel about uh, a young woman who is forced to marry a rather insidious individual, and it's about their courtship and how they come eventually to be married and quite happy. When we look at the early novel, and I promise we're going to get to zombies in a moment, what we tend to find are, and I'm speaking very broadly here, works that are somehow instructive for how it is you should live your life in different circumstances. So Robinson Crusoe, if you know that story at all, gives you a pretty good sense of how it is a proper, you know, British middle class gentleman should live his life if he finds himself in an extreme isolated situation. How do you retain your Britishness, right, um, in a incredibly dire predicament being stranded on an island for a number of years. Pamela, somewhat similar. How should a young, you know, a young woman act as she is invited into kind of the upper echelons of society? What are her obligations to society? What are society's obligations to her? It's not that we have to agree or disagree with the messages, but one of the things we might understand about the early novel is that they tend to have a function. And the function tends to be to tell people how to live their lives in one way or another. There's a number of reasons for this, and a lot of it deals with some anxiety that floats around the early novel, because the novel is emerging in a time when most, most instruction on how to live your life comes from massive religious institutions. So there's always this suspicion around the novel that is somewhat perverse, it's somewhat off-center, it's not quite in step with the socially accepted norms of the day, because it doesn't have the, uh, the, 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 the seal of approval necessarily of the country in which it emerges, its government, or perhaps in its major religious institutions. So there's a lot of kind of anti-novel sentiment, which you might be interested to learn in the 18th century. And that's the time when works like Caruso and Pamela are beginning to surface. Now, it might be the case that there was some good reason for that, because as uh, these decades wear on, we have versions, other kinds of versions, different traditions of the novelist start to emerge. And with respect to zombies, one of the most important traditions to understand is the emergence of the Gothic novel. The Gothic novel, which I'll give you some examples in a few moments of, but that the role of the Gothic novel is simply to excite, is simply to entertain. And its goals are to do so without much regard for cultural conventions of propriety, propriety, excuse me, or good behavior or bad behavior. In fact, it tends to want to shock people by illustrating people acting badly, and I mean really badly, in all kinds of uh, bizarre and often upsetting and scary and terrifying scenarios. So we might go back to the mid-1760s, right around 1764, and see what is largely regarded as the first gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole. A very interesting early effort to give us something like a supernatural ghost story uh, in a novel format. We might look at a work like Matthew Lewis's The Monk, uh, which comes out a number of decades later in 1796. And these are absolutely scandalous works that are illustrating, you know, sexual mores, um, antisocial behavior, um, mysterious and, you know, perverse or sacrilegious scenarios. Um, and Radcliffe, you might be familiar with, who gives us the Italian as well as a number of other very well-regarded, at least the contemporary circles, Gothic novels, which comes out in 1797. Again, these are novels that appeal to, the, to what we think the basic reader might enjoy. They're purely novels of spectacle, um, of emotional kind of derangement, and if you are part of the anti-novelist group, uh, they're going to lead to social destruction. So many of them are banned or are forbidden reading or scandalous reading. This is the home of the zombie. This is where the zombie comes from. How do I know that? Because only a few decades later, we start to get stories that are very much in line with what zombies will become in the 20th century. So some of you may be familiar with Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is first produced and published right around 1818. Okay, and in Frankenstein, we have this wonderfully, um, you know, uh, salacious tale of Victor Frankenstein, the doctor who puts together the body of Frankenstein, brings it back to life, and Frankenstein's monster, not Frankenstein, goes on this terror spree, right? And he's causing destruction, he's causing chaos, but he's also expressing all these fundamental human concerns about wanting to fit in, wanting to be part of 
common society, wanting to be part of polite society, but he's just too horrible to look at. And this novel just takes off in explosive ways over the 19th century. There's all this interest in the tale, multiple versions of the tale are published. Um, we start to get a series as the decades go on of theatrical productions of Frankenstein. People are instantly drawn to this story of an animated corpse trying to fit into the world. And again, this is a full century, actually more than a full century, before the zombie is going to start appearing in, in the American popular mind. But it's not necessarily the same as a zombie. Frankenstein doesn't eat people. Um, you know, he's not he's not mindless. Certainly, he in fact has a very tremendous and well developed mind. He speaks well. These are all things zombies don't do. But as we go through the century, we have the continuing development of the Gothic novel, and when we get to the end of the century, right about 1897, that's when we get our first major vampire text. Okay, we get Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which in some ways predicts some of the characteristics that will go on to be associated with a zombie. So you know in Dracula, you have Dracula the vampire who floats around, flitters around, okay, and transforms young women and other unfortunates into vampires as well through his, you know, selective uh, bleeding of his victims and they become enthralled by him and undermined by him and they essentially become his willing servants. And this idea of the willing servant, okay, that is under the control of, generally speaking, some Eastern European taskmaster, as you'll see with Bela Lugosi and many of the films that we'll watch this semester, becomes a central trope for the zombie story in its first three or four decades in the popular imagination. So there is this creature, the zombie, which is mindless generally, led around generally, at the, at the beck and call of some controlling force, much like in Dracula. Now, obviously, Dracula is about vampires. But what we're starting to see is the foundation for um, uh, the kind of monster that will become the zombie. Now, as we get out of the 19th century, you know, I've been focusing primarily on works that come to us um, out of England or Ireland or uh, you know, associated with continental Europe. As we start to shift across the ocean in the 19th century, we have the emergence of a number of uh, writers who try to carry the Gothic tradition into the unique American landscape, which has to have very different monsters than the monsters that have been established in Europe. So things like the vampire, things like uh, the wolfman, uh, those kinds of kind of long-standing European monsters don't necessarily make a lot of sense in the North American landscape. So we have authors for example, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who tries to wrestle with, well, how do I, how do I make the American landscape uh, a haunted landscape? How do I make the American landscape a place that's ripe for monsters? And in his mind, what he does is he returns to the Puritans, who first came over in the 17th century, right, and were consumed with the notion that they were living in kind of this biblical end times space. And so what Hawthorne does is he starts to imagine d demons and the devil and witches and other long-standing European monsters kind of surviving in the woods of North America. So in 1835, for example, we get the wonderful young Goodman Brown, which gives us a really interesting representation of the devil and witches in North America, a very early version of that, although the Puritans had been worried about that for centuries before. Um, a couple years later, Edgar Allan Poe, right, um, one of our most prolific writers and has left us with some wonderful works, gives us the fall of the House of Usher, which is incredibly gothic in the sense that it borrows the idea of a haunted mansion and a perverse sexual relationship and the degradation of a family and the helpless nature of some, you know, narrator who has wandered into this situation and is trying to figure out what's going on. He also sets it in a castle on the east coast of the United States, which is one of those really funny things because it tells us there's this effort on Poe's part to try to think about the European Gothic story, and he's trying to put it into you know, North America, where there are no century-old castles, where none of that landscape exists. So for some, in some of the ways, the story kind of fails, but it also is this really neat story that shows us that very early on, American authors are trying to make this connection between the new world or the newish world by the, the mid-19th century and the old world, okay? A little bit further on, as we get towards the end of the century, we start to see how American authors begin to do this with a lot of reflection on mental illness or essentially the concept of losing one's mind and what it means to lose your mind. Charlotte Perkins Gilman's gives us again the gothic story, uh, has a heroine 
trapped in the upper stories of a mansion and she's seeing things that may be there, may not be there, but the central premise in 1892 is that she's lost her mind. She's lost her mind for maybe potential, many potential reasons. She could be struggling with postpartum depression. There might be other issues going on. We never really know what's happening, but we do know that the story is drawing very heavily from the Gothic tradition. And then as we break into the 20th century um, and we begin to get an author who will kind of write directly in the line of the zombie tradition, at least in literature, we get H.P. Lovecraft's The Rats in the Walls in 1923. And that's important because we're very close now to the emergence of the zombie in the popular imagination. And the central conceit of the rats in the walls, as is the case with virtually all of Lovecraft's stories, is that there's this connection between uh, horror and terror and madness. And the idea is that one experiences real terror, one experiences real horror, and that that leads to the loss of the mind. Okay, and that's going to be significant for where we'll go in a moment. But before we get into the actual zombie, I just want to back up a little bit because I just used the words terror and horror and I want to give you a more precise definition for those terms. Okay, so I want to back up to a really interesting uh, piece written by Ann Radcliffe, who I mentioned a little while ago. She writes The Italian in 1797, and she gives us this quote, which, which you may find useful, and it's from a publication called On the Supernatural in Poetry. And I'm drawing this uh, from an argument Stephen King um, of local fame makes on Matthew Lewis's The Monk. Okay, so it's a gothic author talking about a gothic author, reflecting on a gothic author, okay? So uh, what, what King basically tells us is that uh, in an essay titled On the Supernatural in Poetry, Radcliffe says that while terror, this is the first term, terror expands the soul and awakens um, the faculties to a higher degree of life, horror contracts, freezes, and nearly annihilates them. Let me repeat that because that central distinction is really important for understanding the zombie. Terror expands the soul and awakens the faculties to a higher degree of life. So the idea there is that there's artistic value to terror because when I am terrified, I am essentially, I've become dilated. I have become, I've awakened, okay, in the sense that it expands my soul. It makes me very, very aware of my surroundings because I'm anticipating something very bad is going to happen. I am terrorized, okay. She contrasts that with the experience of horror, which is something quite different. Horror engenders a very different emotional response in that it contracts, freezes, and annihilates them. It makes you less aware because you're so overwhelmed by the horror that you are indeed encountering. And that distinction between terror as an emotion that expands your perception and horror as an emotion that contracts your, your perceptions is going to be central to this course. Okay. So, so far we've covered this general history of how literature is significant to the development of the novel or how the novel arises as a form of literature. We've thought about the development of the Gothic novel, both in Europe and also in North America. And now we're going to shift focus and start thinking about the actual zombie and what the zombie is and why the zombie is so significant. So a few moments ago, I was talking about how early American authors struggled to define the zombie because, or sorry, not the zombie, struggled to come up with monsters that were unique to North America. Okay. In the early part of the 20th century, if you know much about history, you'll know that after the First World War, there was a lot of concern in North America that Germany would move into Haiti and would start to influence politics in Haiti. And so there was essentially an American invasion. I, I, lose, I use that term rather loosely, but there's an American invasion of Haiti, um, a military takeover of the island, and there's a period when the Haitians are put to work um, by uh, the American military to do infrastructure projects, to rebuild roads, to put together bridges um, that would be appropriate for American machinery to move around. And what I'm saying right now, I'm drawing largely from the work of Jeffrey uh, Shanks, uh, who gives us uh, in a great book, Zombies in the Pulps, the history of how zombies first appeared in American popular fiction. Well, after this invasion of Haiti happens uh, in the early part of the, the, the late teens, early part of the 1920s, uh, a man named William Seabrook, okay, visits Haiti to get a sense of what life is like there because most Americans don't know. There's very few Americans who've been to Haiti and who have come back. 
and he goes to Haiti to write a travelogue, okay, an, an account of his travels and times there, and he produces a book called The Magic Island. And The Magic Island is one of the most important books to know if you're interested in zombies. It's one of the most important books to get your hands on. And that book comes out in 1929. Okay, so in the late 1920s, William Seabrook publishes The Magic Island. And The Magic Island gives us this first initial account of the zombies that are identified as being part of the folklore of the Haitian people. And so there's a great chapter in that book. Um, I believe it's titled Dead Men in the Fields. And in Dead Men in the Fields, Seabrook basically recounts a conversation that he has with some locals. And it starts off with them talking about different kind of, kinds of monsters and folklore, so only a few of which are specific to the island of Haiti. So they talk about vampires, and there's some talk of werewolves and other creatures that have a long European heritage. But then they start to talk about things like fire hags, which are these women who walk through the fields and they burst into flame, and it lights all of the crops on fire. And so you have to watch out for the fire hags because they will destroy all of your crops. But as the conversation goes on, they start to discuss this concept of the zombie. And you get this wonderful little account of what zombies are and where they come from. Now the zombie first emerges in this tale by William Seabrook. This is really the first point of contact for many Americans with the concept of zombie. And here's what it looks like. The zombie is identified as a mindless worker. It's a corpse that has been dug up and before the body could begin to rot, it has been reanimated through some sort of special means, uh, magical means, and it is now mindless and it is at the beck and call of the individual who has brought it back from the grave. It follows that person around and that person in the story that Seabrook is told uh, one day takes uh, a bunch of zombies to go work uh, for a corporation that has set up in Haiti. Uh, Hasco, I believe is the name of it. And the Hasco Corporation is essentially a sugar company okay, in Haiti. And the zombies are led to the company uh, where they work in the fields of the company and they're viewed with great horror by the local population. The local population, Seabrook is told, is so unnerved by the emergence of zombies that when the dead die, they are buried usually in extreme situations so that their bodies can't be dug up. So for example, there's a story of a man whose brother dies and the man watches over his brother's grave for several days armed, ready to shoot anybody who approaches the grave because he's concerned that someone will try to bring his brother back to life and make him a slave to be used at, you know, at the behest of the corporation. Now, there's an awful lot going on in this story that has to do, obviously, with slavery and the experience of slavery as it has played out for the Haitian people, certainly with the experience of slavery as it comes out of Europe and has a massive and very long history in North America and later the United States. But when you hear the original zombie story, what you're essentially hearing is a story of people who are deeply traumatized by the experience of slavery historically. And the fear is that you will be made a slave not only in life, but in a far more horrible sense, you will be made a slave after you die, which is so upsetting to the people of Haiti that they will guard bodies and so, until they begin to rot. And what that essentially means is until they are no longer fit for any kind of work, because as the body degrades, you obviously can't put it to use. We're going to see an excellent representation of this in the first film that we watch, which is White Zombie, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Anyway, this notion emerges late 1920s and almost immediately catches on with the American mind. And we very soon, as Shanks points out, start to get a number of uh, zombie short stories um, appearing in pulps where the zombie starts to emerge in different ways as a monster. And there's different rules in different stories. For example, in some stories, if the zombie is given salt, it will wake the zombie up and it will essentially hunt down the individual who raised it from the grave and will tear that person apart, which is significant to later versions of the zombie where their zombies represented as some this all-consuming monster that tears everybody apart. The idea that there's somebody lurking out around there who will raise you from the grave is connected quite strongly with the history of democracy or the democracer, uh, if you're interested in that types of folklore at all. But the idea there is that there are magicians who have power to raise the dead or power over the dead, uh, Satanist cults, things of that nature. And the zombie is yet another instance 
of their power being demonstrated in this world. So they're a kind of folklore creature as well. So the American imagination grabs onto this probably for a many different reasons. One, it's a time when Haiti is fairly fashionable and all of these films are starting to consider Haiti and more generally the Caribbean region as a spot for shooting movies or telling stories. But the zombie itself in its initial presentation, you know, is literally salt in the wound of the American struggle with slavery, with the American struggle with racism. As you'll see uh, in our in the early films, uh, zombies are almost exclusively minorities. They're almost they're almost exclusively African American actors who play zombies. In fact, in the very early films, the the most terrifying thing about a zombie isn't that a zombie exists, it's that a white person might be turned into a zombie. So there's this long history of racism, both in the anxieties, okay, to go back to my original definition, the anxieties that the zombie represents, um, but we also see in the zombie story certain aspirations uh, for our culture, in the sense that the culture wants to start talking about these things, even though it lacks in many instances the vocabulary to do so, in a way that's accessible for everyday people. So one of the ways to think about zombies, one of the ways to think about monsters, and this is actually, a, this ties back to the actual definition of the word, word monsters, is that a monster is, demonstrates something, okay? And so the, the, the zombie demonstrates in its initial, initial formation uh, the American history of, of, of racism, particularly of slavery, and its relevance to the Caribbean. But American mainland audiences kind of glom onto this with both hands, and what we will see is a number of decades in which the zombie is given a number of different roles to play in popular culture. So to come to the end of this opening lecture, all right, we might ask ourselves, you know, what is a zombie? And the short answer is that it really depends where you are when you ask the question. But we can trace the roots of the zombie um, in so much as we want to trace them to their perhaps an initial appearance to the um, invasion of Haiti, um, to an effort to popularize Haiti, uh, to an effort um, that American artists and storytellers start to have to, excuse me, th this interest in discussing, um, to demonstrating uh, the history of slavery and racial inequality um, in the West through the figure of the zombie. Um, and it then very quickly becomes a pop culture phenomenon and we'll start thinking a lot more about that once we get into the later videos but for this video we just want to be aware that a lot of stuff had to happen before the zombie could show up and where we are right now you know, we might kind of summarize all the stuff that happened with a big grand gesture towards the gothic tradition as it emerges in novels both in Europe in North America, as well as short stories, particularly in North America, in the 19th century. And so by the time we get to the 20th century, 1920s, we have a population eager for Gothic stories, we have a population eager for short stories, and we have a population that in many instances has been deeply traumatized by the ongoing issue uh, of race and place um, in North America. So all these things are floating around and it will explode. It explodes in the vision and the figure of the zombie. And as we look at that figure, what we realize is that we're seeing much more than a monster. We're seeing a demonstration of our anxieties as they relate to those themes. And that's what the zombie is, potentially, initially. We'll think much more about it as we move into the course and start to look at other works.